welcome everybody to this month's Digging Deep webinar about seasonal affective disorder and what it is and tips and tricks of what to do with it and how to combat it if you have that. Uh, my name is Rosemary Lockhorst. I am the producer of the game Shadow's Edge for Digging Deep and I have with me Dr. Christy Pigiewicz. Do you want to just introduce yourself a little bit, Christy? Sure. So I currently work in a school, a K-8 school, as a school psychologist. I also have in the past had a private practice, and I'm a mother of two amazing kiddos. I live here in Colorado, so seasonal affect disorder um, isn't a huge, doesn't have a ton of prevalence here, but um, I, my heart is in Bozeman, Montana, where my son was born, where it absolutely was an issue for a lot of people. Yeah, and I, I live in Switzerland, and it's an issue for a lot of people here too, especially if you go like higher up in the mountain, then you, you're you obviously on top of the mountain, you see things, but if you're down in the valley, then it gets really dark really soon in the evening, um, so I've, I've seen this happen too. I happen to love this season. I think I'm, I'm one of the odd ones out. I just think it's magic with the color changes, and it's so cozy with the dark, but that's not for everybody, so just to, to sort of set us into this mood for this season... <laughs> Can you explain a little bit, Yeah, what is it? What is seasonal affective disorder if, for those who aren't really familiar with the term? Totally. So it is at its heart a mood disorder and primarily it's characterized by depression. And what makes it unique is that it occurs the same time every year. So it's directly related to less sunlight um, and the effects on the brain um, during that time of year. So when it is darker. And can you explain a little bit, like how many people deal with that and, and why, you know, who's at risk of getting it? Why are some people at risk of getting it and, and some people aren't and sort of where does it show up and where does it come from? Yeah, I was actually really surprised by these numbers. So as of 2020, um, in the United States, so this is just the US alone, um, it is absolutely considered very common. For example, here we have over 3 million cases per year that are um, officially diagnosed. So that doesn't even touch the people who experience it at a tolerable or more moderate level or who don't go to their um, doctors or physicians and get a formal diagnosis. So when the days get shorter and the nights get longer, um, specifically seasonal affect disorder mostly occurs, excuse me, in climates where there's uh, significantly less sunlight um, during specific times of year. So obviously as you get closer to the equator, um, it's not felt as much. Yeah, of course. And you, so you're saying that that's like, a, that's a huge number. I'm quite surprised by that as well. So what, who is more at risk of getting it within those? Is it just like where you are or are there also, you know, reasons or things why you might be more, uh, your, your body might be more open to this happening to you? Yeah, that's a great question. And from what I understood, and again, I tried to update the res my research and my understanding before this webinar, um, it's a little bit controversial, that answer, especially in COVID times. So it specifically tends to appear between the ages of 18 and 30. Um, however, uh, that might not be biological. It might actually just be the simple fact that 18 to 30 tends to be a time when people move from their hometown or their family of origin um, to different climates or different places um, throughout the US. Also, we have to always keep in mind, we have to always keep the glasses on that we are living in COVID times. So things that may have been tolerable um, previous years, previous winters, previ previous falls, um, the increased stress, the increased isolation, um, all of those can impact uh, things like seasonal affect disorder and many other disorders. And you're saying so it, it, it generally starts showing up, you know, in sort of the late teens is when we when we see it more. Could that also be because that's exactly when people are finding their identity, exploring more and want to go out more and do things and, and try things, which, of course, is a lot harder in, in darker times, if you will. <laughs> Absolutely. I um, I completely agree. And it also it was interesting because the main group of people or group body of research that sort of um, has some discrepancy here between the 18 and 30 number is actually boarding school families. Um, so children or, or young adults who go away to boarding school tend, especially, you know, the Pacific Northwest, <laughs> tend to um, have very, um, I'm going to say crippling, but very significant impact of seasonal affect disorder, even though they're not in that 18 to 30 um, age range. So 
I do wonder if it is just simply linked to the, the change in sunlight that your body is used to or your body has become accustomed to. That makes a lot of sense. So now we know what it is. <laughs> what, uh, what does it look like in a child and, and, or a teen or a young adult? And, and does that change? Like, the, is it different in different age groups and, you know, what that, what that means and what it shows up as, what are the symptoms? So I, I have this, um, <laughs> I'm smiling because I at home have two amazing teenagers. And when you read through this list or you hear this list, um, it does parallel really, really um, well with puberty. So just hold that in mind and we'll talk about that at the end. <laughs> um, so basically you're looking for a change in mood. So depression, sadness, irritability. Um, for people who feel it more significantly, it can be a feeling of hopelessness or discouragement, even worthlessness. Um, for younger children, you'll see things like be crying more irritable or get upset more easily. Um, you'll have an increase in negative thinking. So the, for example, the preteen or teenage or young adult might become more self-critical, more sensitive to criticism. So again, the teenage years developmentally, that is already in place, but it might be amplified. Um, these people, you know, everyone from adults to young adults might complain more, blame, find fault, um, or see problems more often than usual. I'm smiling again because my son walked in and my daughter was just waking up and she's like, I hate hearing you breathe. <laughs> and, and you have to remember that you're looking for a change. So um, that morning irritability is part of who my daughter is and we love her and you gently have to give her some space. So it's not necessarily like, oh my gosh, I'm worried for her about seasonal affect disorder, but you're looking for a change as the daylight gets shorter. Again, here's some more significant impacts, um, a lack of enjoyment. So people with seasonal affect disorder might lose interest in things that they normally like to do. Um, they might lose interest in friend groups or start, stop going to social situations. Again, COVID can definitely have more of an impact there because that social situation can help alleviate some of these symptoms and we're more isolated now. Um, you may feel tired, low energy, lack of motivation, um, and just feel this overall effort, like everything just takes more effort, which is just, it sort of feels like it's weighing on you a little too much. Three more quick things, um, changes in sleep patterns. So again, this is very typical for puberty or preteens or teenagers. Um, so it's just definitely something to think about. You might sleep more than usual. Um, you might find it harder to get up and get ready for school or for work in the mornings. Um, looking for changes in patterns of eating. Um, specifically things like um, carbohydrates or these comfort foods or sugary foods. Um, and again, the ten tendency to overeat. Um, sometimes because of that, you have some weight gain during the winter months, tend to be pretty common in, in climates where you have less sunlight. And finally, uh, less, or I'm sorry, uh, difficulty concentrating. So it, it seems like a depression, it becomes hard to focus. And again, you're looking for a dip in things like schoolwork or grades, et cetera. Um, Remember, so this does sound like puberty, but remember the seasonal affect disorder, the person notices these changes during the time of year when there are fewer daylight hours. So as the season changes, as you move into spring and the days become longer, the depression, all of these symptoms should get better. But most importantly, if you're concerned, you should talk to your healthcare provider because they can absolutely diagnose this um, and they have careful evaluations. They have different things that they can do to diagnose you um, and ask questions, listen to what they're saying, because for everyone, this might be, you might experience some symptoms, but might not experience all. And that's completely normal. Um, and they can also do a health checkup to make sure that other factors aren't what's um, causing you to feel those symptoms. And um, so you're saying this this shows up between 18 and, and 30. Is this something then that, that you will have a tendency to for life? Or is this something where, you know, it, it changes again if you if you don't change your environment? Or <laughs> what's the what's the, what are the, 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 the symptoms and outcomes there? I, I love this question because I think you're hitting on the great controversy of, you know, genetic, you know, nature versus nurture. Um, so obviously everyone has predispositions based on, you know, nature factors. And then obviously we all during more stressful times like COVID, you know, the nurture factor. So if your work, if your school, if um, you have a decrease in your social support systems, et cetera, um, you do have higher risk of, you know, all of these different types of things. So 
yes, <laughs> um, you might have particular uh, uh, crushing a longer uh, workload. So you might be spending more time indoors than you typically would on most winters, or you might have a particularly high brew of other extenuating circumstances that are stressing you. So you might experience seasonal affect disorder more acutely one or two years. And then in other years, you might gently feel like you sleep a little bit more and maybe you tend to cook soup and chicken pot pie, I don't know. And, and it feels very tolerable. So. Um, you can't take away, you can't take the person out of the soup. So you are a product of your environment and you all are also a product of your genetic um, predisposition. So just hold it lightly and there's help. So it doesn't have to be overwhelming. Is this a relatively new idea in psychology or has this been around for a while? And, and why is it now just more prevalent in, in, in you know, media? And why do we learn more about this now, particularly? Do you think COVID also had an impact on, on this popping up more? It's a great question. So uh, fundamentally, um, seasonal depression is brought on by the brain's response to the shorter daylight hours. So daylight affects two chemicals in your brain. It, affects melatonin and serotonin. And these two chemicals work together to regulate your sleep-wake cycles, as well as your energy and mood. So melatonin, as all of you know, I'm sure, is linked directly to sleep. Um, your brain makes melatonin when it's dark, essentially. It's like a trigger. It signals mm -hmm. to make it. Higher melatonin levels um, cause you to feel sleepy <laughs> and less energetic. Now, serotonin also is linked to um, mood and energy, and your brain makes more serotonin when you're exposed to sunlight. Um, however, serotonin um, boosts feelings of happiness, it boosts well-being, and low levels of serotonin make you feel depressed or disconnected. So shorter days and longer hours of darkness in the fall and winter cause this chemical reaction of increased levels of melatonin and lower levels of serotonin, and it creates, again, that which is to um, the biological conditions for depression. Um, so it has always been part of your brain, part of um, our body's natural rhythms. Um, and <laughs> again, if you have increased stressors, you might be feeling it more acutely. Or if your body is used to the Colorado light dark pattern, the sunlight darkness pattern, and it feels comfortable, you feel like you're in a rhythm, and then you move to Bellingham, Washington, you move somewhere where it's a significantly different rhythm, you're going to feel that. Um, and it might be tolerable, but there are ways to feel better. So, you know, you can mitigate some of those symptoms. And, and is this something that has been studied for a while in psychology or... How is, how is it now more prevalent? How do we see this? Why do we see this now? Yeah, so previously, I think, again, this is sort of controversial. I, so as we learn more about our brain, as we learn more about how our brain functions and reacts to certain stimulus, et cetera, through, because of um, increased imaging, increased um, diagnostic tools, et cetera, we are then able to sort of tease out some of these differences. So absolutely, 10, 20, 30 years ago, um, you might just get a label of depression or um, it might, some of those symptoms might be um, uh, dismissed a little bit more as sort of you know, not a big deal. Um, if you go back far enough, it might actually be like, you don't wanna waste the resource of candles, so you want to actually sleep more. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we are living in this cutting edge time where we're you know, pushing our bodies further than evolutionarily our bodies are ready for. So yes, we do have increased diagnosis of this. However, the brain's reaction to daylight to these cycles has always been there. So um, whether or not it was correctly diagnosed or whether or not we even needed a diagnosis, because again, if you go back far enough, we probably wanted to sleep at nighttime, um, is sort of, you know, kind of interesting conversation, I guess. It'd be fun to have drinks and talk about it. <laughs> so now that we have like a, a little bit better understanding of 
you know, what it, what it is and how it works and what the causes are. I also wanted to go into what can we do against it? So what, what can, what helps? And there's, for me, there's two factors in here. One might be mental, you know, what can we, mm -hmm. are there any things that, that in our heads we can prepare ourselves for or things we can do about it? And then one might be simply physical, like tools, you know, stuff mm -hmm. that, that, that might help. Can you maybe start with the mental part first? Absolutely. And I'll also keep in mind that um, sometimes you're a caregiver. So for example, um, participating in the treatment process, so talking to the doctors or talking to your child's doctors about what they feel would be most helpful for them um, is definitely the first step. So get the diagnosis, have those conversations. Then you're going to want to play with some research. So whether it's you or your child, you're going to want to make sure you understand what this is, understand what is happening in your body, sort of that normalizing piece. It also helps, especially for children and teens and young adults, it helps give the language like what is happening. <laughs> so it's not dismissed and it doesn't feel overwhelming and it feels like there's hope. This will get better. Uh, another great suggestion, and this is a simple one, and it can be very preventative too, if you know that this is something that happens to you regularly, um, schedule out some fun social activities in October, in November, in December. Um, find that quality time. And it doesn't have to be social. You know, If you're like me, a little bit more of an introvert, it can be low key, it could be a movie. Um, it could be you know, any of these small things, but just sort of give yourself that schedule where I'm gonna make some quality time for myself. Or I'm going to make some quality time for my for me to share with my child or teen who's experiencing this. Be patient. <laughs> Don't expect the symptoms to ease right away. So if you go to the doctor, you get the diagnosis, you're like, all right, now I'm fixed. It's not going to be like that. Um, low energy, low motivation, all of these things are part of it. And it's going to take a little bit for your body to figure out the right sort of physical, like you said, or, um, you know, I'm sorry, mental or more physical tools that work for you or work best for you. These are simple things what, that I know. Oh, I'm, oh go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, so, please. What would you advise then also? Is it like activities? Does it matter what kind of activities or where they are if they just feel good? Or are you specifically saying also go outside, you know, fight oh, the light? Definitely. What are the yeah. what are the things you would say there, especially mentally, you know? Oh, absolutely. So for most people, seasonal affect disorder, um, simply spending more time outside during daylight hours is enough to relieve the depression. So simply going out, exercising, taking a walk each day and making it a regular part of your routine um, for most individuals is actually enough. So you don't need to move on to something like light therapy or phototherapy. So those are um, special light boxes or light bulbs, um, and they can be placed on a tabletop or desk and you um, schedule time each day to uh, expose yourself to, to light. So for example, 45 minutes a day or so, and typically doctors recommend that exposure um, in the morning. And obviously, you know, as you sort of have tried you know, eating well, exercising, going out for walks. You've tried all these different things. You've made a regular healthy routine for yourself and it's still just not working. Um, talking to your doctor about combining approaches. So, you know, maybe a little bit of phototherapy, maybe going in and finding a therapist who understands this and can help with some of those negative self-talk pieces. And then finally, uh, medication. So the typical uh, depression medications like an SSRI is incredibly um, useful and can be have a huge impact on seasonal affect disorder. So you and your doctor will sort of figure out and try the least restrictive or the, <laughs> the lightest approach first, you know, go out every day, bring your dog out for a walk, and then you sort of keep layering it until you find the right piece for you or your child that will work. Yeah, and I want to get back to, to medication a bit too, but also you talked about these these lights, these light boxes. I uh, I used to travel a lot to Norway and to Sweden, and so I saw that saw those there, and they were they're actually really quite nice. Um, but then there's also now newer technologies that may be able to help with with that. You know, getting as you say, getting into routine applications maybe that can help you work with that routine and just really log your progress. Um, and then have you heard of seasonal depression glasses? I have. So those are the, and those are especially, if I'm understanding correctly, especially um, popular, should I say, in, in the UK. So they're like the, the pink lenses. Is that right? 
Yeah, it's 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 a little bit like uh, you know we we have in here in Europe we have a um, a, a saying that if you see the world better you you got you watch them through pink glasses, right? I love and it. So it's kind of it's it's kind of a little bit like that. That's maybe also where it came from. I don't know, but but do you think something like that could also be 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 helpful, or um, is that just do you think it's just a fad? I mean, it's it's just an opinion in this case. Well. <laughs> I think that finding what works for you is what you need. So absolutely, if you can't get out for a daily walk or um, you know, the pink glasses for one reason or another, it feels right and it works for you, I say do it. Like yeah. it's it's important to remember that what works for one person might not work for another. And just because you both let your neighbors, you both live in the same you know, environment, you are experiencing different things. You have a different genetic predisposition. So being open to several different treatments. There's also a lot of research um, and, you know, it's not super controversial around things like acupuncture um, and even massage. Some of those things, those kind of like OT self-regulating pieces um, can also be really effective to sort of um, get your body's nervous system back on track and feeling good. Yeah, maybe in line with that music, for, for example, could, could potentially work. So I'm just trying to get some more ideas out here, you know, for people who are listening into this. Um, when I worked at Microsoft, we had an aquarium. And oh. funny enough, that was, uh, so we had this room that where one complete wall was an aquarium and beautiful fishes, all, always obviously very colorful and everything. And then they just had uh, chairs in there and the room was dark. So you couldn't turn on the light or anything. You had to find your way, way in. And all you did there was lay there basically and just watch the fish. And the, the, the funny bit was that that room was always busiest come October, November. Um, and so I, that's, that's just what I remember from it. You know, Otherwise in the summer, nobody really would be in there. Um, but but things like that might be helpful as well, or vitamin D, taking vitamin extra mm -hmm. vitamin D. So that's why I said I wanted to come back a little bit to medication and things because I I agree with you. You know, going to your doctor is absolutely a good step to then do that. But might there be like supplements or other things, you know, food specifically that might help um, in these cases that that might give some energy. Absolutely. So um, because one of the major symptoms is this idea of comfort food or carbohydrates or looking for that energy in food, it's important again, and I'm not saying we all have to be like weekly food planners and like have every meal, but just, you know, getting some of those things, like maybe you have a plan or a calendar where you specifically put in you know, where are you going to get daylight today? Like, I'm going to take my dog for a walk. And then what do you, you know, plus or minus want to try to eat um, so that you don't have those food cravings that you're going to then um, use sugar and carbohydrates to fulfill. So absolutely, the idea of a well-balanced diet, diet can help. Uh, definitely those sleep patterns. So, you know, I, I don't mean to make a, a plug, but something like Shadow's Edge, where you can sort of get some of these thoughts out of your mind so you can sleep better. Also other apps like Calm or whatnot, where um, you have a regular routine where you don't get tempted by looking at the news or your email, you, you know, as soon as you lay down, you hit Calm. <laughs> Even if you're like fighting it a little bit because you're irritable, like you just, you have a routine. Like I get my stuff down on paper, I journal, I go to Shadow's Edge, I do something to get that out. And then now I'm in this mode of, of calm relaxation. I love what you said about the fish. And I'm just wondering, I, I don't know this. I'm not an aquarium person, but I'm so curious if the lights on a fish tank might be full spectrum lights as well. It's, so, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a fish person it's either. It's so just, cool. Yeah. For me, it was no. a room to go in when I needed to think about like sort of a sales strategy or something like that. And I didn't want to be disturbed because they, you weren't it. allowed to talk there. It's dark. You know, you can really just think in peace. And so no, that's I want to go there. That sounds wonderful. That. <laughs> yeah, it was actually, it was, it was really nice, actually, I have to, I have to admit that, I, but also same thing, I, I would never have that at home, but, uh, but in there, it was really nice, somebody else took care of the fish, which probably totally. in my case, in my case was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Mine too. <laughs> um, so with, with that, you know, are there any other things that you can think of that, that might, might help? So you mentioned, for example, you know, avoiding like these peaks of sugar and, and things like that, even though comfort food obviously is, it sounds like a very wintry thing but are there any other other activities or something that you say are you know is it is it about more about cardio is it more about just generally being fit or what what are the differences there do you know 
Yeah. So if you could kind of imagine it like a, you know, a pie chart kind of thing, you definitely want some form of exercise, but maybe that form is when you get home from work and it's dark on your Peloton. Great. That sounds awesome. You'll get that cardio or maybe even just do a mellow one. You get your body going, your metabolism going, which is awesome. Your body starts producing endorphins, which are happy things. That's great. But you also want to have somewhere in that pie chart, your exposure to daylight. So even if you have a big deadline, even if you spend, you know, if you're a child, you spend a lot of time in school um, and maybe you just want to read in the classroom instead of going out for recess and putting your boots on and doing all that. Really, as a teacher, as a parent, as an educator, someone like get the kids outside. <laughs> you really also need on that pie chart, you need that direct exposure to sunlight. So if you want to save time, you could go for a run and go for a run outside, you know, so if you don't have enough time to do both, um, but intentionally try to get enough of both of those on your plate. I really can't stress enough um, having a specific, if you know this is a concern for you, for your family, or you're worried about it because you're making a move to like the Pacific Northwest or somewhere that's darker, really intentionally scheduling yourself. Um, exposure to sunlight, exercise, what am I going to eat that's healthy, like throughout the day, maybe it's just two meals, and this is what I'm going to really focus on. And, you know, maybe lunchtime, I might just have to grab something because that's what's available. And then also really those connected times. So whether it's a phone call home each day, you know, one day, and then, you know, quiet movie time, just yourself another day, maybe it's, you know, hanging out with my dog, you know, like whatever that is, but just realize that that special time, that connection is also really important somewhere on that pie chart. Because as you do lose motivation, as you do sort of sink into this, it's harder and harder to get out. So making yourself that schedule, keeping yourself accountable is a great way to sort of um, not sink as deep. But can't normalize enough you're right whether it's homeopathic or natural medications or going to your doctor and getting um, a prescription medication that is it's not failure <laughs> that's what your body needs to be able to live the life that you want to live so um, you know you just have to find the right cocktail for you and what works for you yeah, well, quality dog time definitely works for me. I can tell you that <laughs> uh, from cuddling to walks, you know, it's just something where I really have to focus on the dog and not on yeah. myself or my problems or anything around me. So that's definitely something that helps for me. Um, me I, I want to go to school for a bit. What, how does it mm -hmm. dealt with in a school setting? And you know, is there any protocols for that? Is it even looked at or, or, you know, are there any specific things that teachers look for or counselors? What's your experience? You're being a school psychologist. Sure. I thought you're the right person to ask this. <laughs> so I've worked in public schools in Bellingham, Washington, and I've worked um, in Bozeman, Montana for a long time in a middle school as well. Um, sadly, <laughs> uh, we had no awareness or protocols. So I think the first step is for this basic level of education and getting the word out. So sometimes that means parents have to advocate for their child and sort of let teachers or administrators know, um, you know, this is my child's kind of natural rhythms. And what I need you to do is try to encourage them to go outside. Or what I need is, you know, during these certain times of months, um, we're going to have this supplement um, in the the student will go to the front office and take it to sort of help, you know, manage their symptoms. We really have to focus too um, for parents, for educators in boarding school settings again, or college settings, sort of that freshman year, sophomore year piece. So when we have a change in the person's typical rhythm, so whether you're moving or going to college or going away to boarding school, um, your social supports are different, they're often less. And um, you're also getting different input in terms of sunlight. So it's not a small thing. You can't just dismiss it and say, oh, whatever, like I'm tough, I'm strong. Yes, and <laughs> your brain is producing more melatonin and less, you know, like you really have to understand that this is a chemical piece. So um, getting help when you start to notice the first bit of symptoms can help so much instead of waiting until you are feeling really overwhelmed and really starting to shut down. Um, so, Again, some of these preventative pieces, like, you know, in a school, like, okay, so we're going to talk about Huck Finn instead of just sitting and turning to your partner and talk, let's go outside and walk and talk. Or, you know, trying to make sure your school has things like regular PE or exercise incorporated into their day or yoga. 
Um, you know, making sure even through middle school or high school, you have a version of recess or a version of getting outside and having some free play. Um, those things are huge preventative measures. So if you're a parent, you can help your school board, your school, your administrators, your teachers, and really advocate for in the winter months when it's hard to put on if you've, I'm sorry, if you've ever been down in the kindergarten wing when it's winter time and they're putting on like, they put the boots it's on and then they, they forgot to put the pants on and then they have to take the boots off and then they have like, it's a thing. And I completely understand as a kindergarten teacher being like, we're doing indoor recess and we're going to play games or we're going to craft and we're going to have fun, which is great. And that whole rigmarole, that whole routine, the 15 minutes it takes to get outside is actually really important too. So it's all about balance and making sure you have a system that works for you, but preventative measures, um, getting out ahead of it is huge. That makes a lot of sense. And so let's go to the opposite side. Opposite mm -hmm. side. What, is there a point where if you have these moods and these changes and these emotional challenges, is that where do we see, how do we see that this may be a sign of something more going on for young people and that it's not, just seasonal? How do we know when to seek help for this? Yeah, so, you know, that's a hard question to answer directly because this is so, you know, personally felt. Um, it really depends on the person's severity of symptoms. And, you know, by definition, the symptoms for seasonal affect disorder should ease in the spring. So right away, if you don't notice that shift, as daylight and um, nighttime you know, adjust, um, right away that should be a huge warning sign that this could be something more. Again, you can't stress enough during COVID, sometimes symptoms that previously have been mild are more severe. And mm -hmm. sometimes um, it might be one of those, again, we're close to Halloween, witch's brew of a little season affect disorder, a little increased stress, you know, some grief because of, you know, people you may have lost in your life or changes in your life in terms of unemployment or, or whatnot. So um, things are much more complicated um, in terms of mental health for both adults and children. So now more than ever, uh, go and talk to your doctor, take it seriously, get a consult. Um, they're the ones who will help you sort of tear apart this and put the pieces of the puzzle back together um, and start to offer some suggestions for relief. So these last two years, now more than ever, go get help, go talk to someone who, who really knows what to do. And how in, in that area, how can I best support my teen if, if I notice they're going through something, but as you say, teens also still are teens and they're developing brains and they might not wanna to talk to you about it and they might not think that it's an issue because they think it's part of a bigger thing or you know, school just sucks and that's why, et cetera. So how, how do, do you have any tips for opening that conversation with my, my teen or my child? Yeah, I sort of, in, in my view, I have sort of two prong approach. One is making sure that uh, from childhood through teenage, young adult, the, the individual has the language to talk about this. So how are you feeling? How big are you feeling? What do you need? What tools work for you? And making some of those mental health um, health uh, part of your family's um, dialogue like so you would talk openly about you know feeling sad or depressed or you would talk openly about the impact a hard day of work had you know developmentally had on your day or your ability to sort of focus and parent the way you would want to focus um, so normalizing that like your mental health is just as important as you know breaking an arm or whatnot from there, I'm smiling because we just had a student yesterday who was upset because of a move and, you know, they're moving from their family home of origin, you know, home to a, a different house in the same town. Um, and their parents who are wonderful, phenomenal people are very wrapped up in the logistics of the move and getting the new house ready and the mortgages and selling their house, all of these things. And this little one who's, you know, in middle school was just like, I need to talk to someone not involved in this situation. <laughs> so, you know, she just was beside herself in tears, but she really needed and she was crying out for this outside resource. So um, having a therapist, normalizing having a therapist, having support, um, and it can be so valuable at a young age because then when she does potentially go off to college and feels like she doesn't have a lot of social you know, systems, 
friends to talk to and you're a phone call away, but still your way, um, she knows that I can resource, a, you know, the school counseling system. I can resource, um, you know, the local therapy systems and networks so that I can get help, feel mentally healthy as I develop these social foundations. Yeah, and that's actually good leeway also into my next question, because now you're, you're saying, okay, if you address this, and, and especially if you build this good habit of having them check in with themselves and dare to ask for help, what happens if it isn't addressed? What's the other side of, of that coin? You know, what, what if we don't do anything about it? What happens then? Yeah, it, it's so, um, it depends on the person's severity of symptoms. So again, because of COVID, please try to get it addressed <laughs> because the symptoms can uh, rapidly um, be larger than you might be used to or might have experienced previous seasons. Having said that, you know, the, the idea of severe depression, the idea of severe worthlessness, um, when you are a teen or a young adult and you don't have your prefrontal cortex, which is, helps with your ability to think of yourself into the future, can really start to feel overwhelming. It can start to feel like, I'm going to feel like this forever. Um, there's no point. Like all of that negative self-talk can really get amplified because of the developmental changes going on for them. So um, take it seriously. Uh, talk to your doctor, talk to your teen, normalize it, help them with the language. Like, tell me more about that. And if you ask that question, tell me more about that. You know, they're in bed, they've been in bed all day. You went to work, you came back, they're still in bed. Oh my gosh, what's going on? And you just had a long day. If you're not ready for them to answer that question, don't ask it right then. <laughs> and I say that laughingly, but they can read that on your face. Like yeah. if you're saying one thing, like, I want to hear more, tell me about your day. But your face is like, oh my God, I'm totally overwhelmed. Please don't. Um, that's not the right time. You have to make time to connect um, when they're ready, when you're ready, all of those different pieces. Um, so yes, during COVID, during this time, I think more than ever, um, helping your child realize that there is help available and that you can help them get help is, is a huge um, bridge that you'd be building that could last for the rest of their life. Even if you bring them to their doctor or to a therapist and they decide, oh, we're just gonna do two or three sessions. Um, so we're gonna help develop or fine tune this language. And we're gonna help you know, this child become more of an advocate for what they need within this certain circumstance. Great, like it, it doesn't have to be a forever thing. It can just be a, you know, a short term piece. Right. Um, do you have any recommendations for resources and, you know, where people can find more information? Because we've, we've handled a lot of questions, but I'm sure there, there's more and we're going to open it up for Q&A just in a second. But before we do that, do you have any like recommendations? You know, where can we learn more? How do we understand more? Well, I think that's one good thing about COVID is um, finding a lot, lot more resources have become or have an online component. So you're not alone. Connect with others so that you can learn more about, um, oh, I didn't know that symptom might be part of seasonal affect disorder, or, oh, I never heard about, you know, glasses. Let me try that. Or how did you get your insurance to cover that? Or all of those different pieces. So whether it's communities or people within your town, or like we said, because of COVID, more and more of those communities are going online and are easily reached online really educating yourself and connecting with other people who've had like or similar experience um, can absolutely help you understand what's going on in your body, normalize it, and then also offer some other treatment options and trying to figure out what's gonna work for you. All right. Um, so I, um, I think that that was questions that we had, we do, we can still discuss more. However, I also do want to give a little bit of a chance to our audience. So if anybody has a question, you can just um, unmute yourself, right, Lacey? I'm picking here to Lacey because she's the moderator for <laughs> Q&A. Um, and also uh, you can type your question in here if there's any other questions. And otherwise I can just keep going and ask questions as well. Um, but feel free to type in or to just open it up and, you know, just talk here in person. Uh, you can just simply unmute yourself and join our session. Um, 
I would love to understand a little bit more about what are the differences. So if you have, uh, you're, you're talking now about, you know, COVID and I, and, and I understand that it's very difficult to say this, but like, how do we see, even in ourselves, what's the difference between, okay, this has gone on for a long time. And so that's there too. Now it's really just more the light or, or, you know, so what is the, how do we see that difference in ourselves? Are there anything that you can help, uh, help us with on, on that side? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, you know, working in a school when I talk with teachers, um, sometimes, you know, specific diagnosis can really help us to make sure that we're giving the student all the supports that they might need. Uh -huh. Other times, um, you can try a support, you can try something like phototherapy and look at the results. So sort of see how your body responds a little bit. So yes, again, it might be a little bit of you know, seasonal affect disorder and you have a whole lot of stress and a little this and a little that, but for one reason or another, incorporating regular walks outside with my dog and 30 minutes each morning with a light box, um, I feel a lot better. I feel more um, engaged in my work, more, you know, excited to be social, even if that's, you know, Zoom calls with friends. Um, but it's sort of, you, you just want to always be checking in with yourself. Um, this idea of having that, um, you know, fake smile, like everything's okay, you know, how are you today? I'm fine. Like, you know, maybe you have to do that and work or in a certain situation because you don't have time to get into the details, but make time for yourself to really check in. Like, how are you doing? <laughs> like, uh, are you getting like stuck in the weeds? Are you feeling a little overwhelmed? And if you are um, starting to layer in some of those supports for yourself so that um, it doesn't get to the point where it becomes a real, you know, extreme situation, I guess. You've also talked about, you know, the school setting, etc. cetera. Um, if we go a little bit older and say young adults, for example, then some of these uh, young adults may be in school in college settings. Um, do you have any, any tips for them specifically? Because it's probably harder in a college setting to go to your teacher and say, I need regular, <laughs> regular exercise. Um, but also on, maybe in a work session, you know, if they have like uh, apprenticeships or if they're just starting out with their job, what are things that they can do when, when the pressure is really much higher from employers, et cetera, as well um, for them to perform, if you will? Right. You know, sort of like the gold standard, <laughs> your ultimate hope is that you start young. So sort of as kids are growing up, sort of working with that dialogue and those kind of like check-ins and prioritizing mental health and really consciously talking in your family of origin about, I'm doing this because my mind needs this. <laughs> like, I know it doesn't make sense to you that when I first get home from work, I have to sit down and watch a rerun of Friends. I get that, but that's what I need and you're advocating for that within your family. Having said that, you're absolutely right. As people start to you know, leave their family of origin or even as a young adults or adults move within you know, different places, really sort of having the language so that you can be watching for things or have that awareness. So, you know, if your student is, or if your child is moving from Colorado to Western Washington University in Bellingham, you know, having conversation in the summer in August as they're getting their stuff together saying, I'm going to put this in, you know, in with your sweaters here. And it's sort of a list to remind you to check in because in Washington, it's going to be a lot darker and that's totally normal. Um, this is what your brain's doing. So um, can, you know, let's make sure that you look at this and call me and we'll talk about it because they have a great counseling center up there and it doesn't have to be super severe. So sort of um, those little reminders to yourself or to your child or to your young adult that this is completely normal. It's your brain's chemistry. It's okay. We can talk about it. It's not going to last forever. Um, and there's help. So all of those little pieces, and it can be fun, like putting a note in a sweater box or putting, you know, in with your comforter, you know, putting, you know, a little bit of lavender, but in the lavender, putting something to remind you, oh, that's right. Last year at this time, <laughs> I remember how low it went. Um, I just want it super quick. It's not just COVID, but sometimes um, life situations. So if you had a death, you know, for example, yeah, during the winter Very months, true during you know a certain time of year especially you feel lonely um, all of those things can exasperate this for sure so your body is naturally producing more melatonin naturally with the serotonin and then you have a life event or a 
anniversary of a life event that just you know blows it all up yeah that makes that makes a lot of sense um i want to tack on to that question but also uh, we had a question from the audience and Lacey's answered it in the chat but basically mm -hmm. they um somebody was asking lena was asking about light boxes if they were expensive and so we've answered that there's a range of 25 to 100 dollars i mean it really depends also on sizes a lot uh, with lights and so we've given a, a a link to some ideas for for those lights um what you're saying, for example, with you know what what you need, just what you said before, I think also uh, how what can friends do? So we've talked about what can a parent do. What can friends do if they see that a person that they like, or you know, because that's a little bit of a different situation, they can't really take them to a doctor or you know tell them to do specific things. How would you encourage a person? Um, to to seek help and how would you what what would you say that that shows that you um, that you've seen them and seen yeah. their problems? Oh, you just you just nailed it exactly. Um, the idea of being seen and um, by your friends. I I want to acknowledge that during COVID now we all have limited bandwidth, so we still love our friends, we love our family, but we are trying to keep ourselves afloat sometimes. <laughs> So it is tricky because you don't want to deplete yourself or your own family to sort of um, constantly feel like you have to fill up that other person's bucket. So whatever you are thinking of doing, making sure that it is either sustainable. So those check-ins like, okay, every Monday I'm going to have dinner at my mom's house to check in, see how she's doing. You know, she just moved into a condo, whatever. Um, and I can sustain that. Like I can make that part of my plan and every Monday I can do that. And that feels right to me. Um, the other piece is those um, gestures. So, you know, just frankly talking about like, I wish I could do more. Please let me know how I can help. And you just send them flowers and write that in the note. Or, you know, here, it's so funny. We have uh, parent-teacher conferences and the administrative team. We wanted to do something for teachers. And teachers this year, like, we want to do the world. Like, we want to cancel February and send them to Hawaii. And, like, <laughs> like we wish, we wish, we wish, because we see how hard everyone's working. Uh, and we just can't do that, you know? So, realistically, what we could do is, you know, we have a ton of snacks. Like, everything from healthy treats to, like, Funyuns or something really gross. Like, a whole array in this one, like, this table filled. And it wasn't just the tables. Like, they each had a bag with their name on it. And then inside the bag, there was a note that said, you know, sometimes food is what we do when we don't have words to say how much we care or something like that. But the idea of just, I see you, I see how hard you're working. I wish I could do more, but please know I'm here and I'm watching and, you know, my door's open, um, might be something that you can sustainably do. So we have a lot of caregivers. We have a lot of people, empaths out there in the world who have huge hearts, who see other people hurting, who just pour into that and just devote a lot of time and love and energy and effort into that. Um, but you want to make sure that it's sustainable because your energy, your bandwidth is also finite. Um, so take care of yourself first. That's a that's a very good point as well, and uh, I would assume that f for them also it's then very similar, right? Um, so maybe that's something that they could then also explain to the people that they're taking care of or that they're helping, and and really relate to them and say that they're dealing with with these types of things as well, and and that might help as a connection as well. Do you think? Oh, without a doubt, and it's the whole idea of normalizing it, especially if you are like an adult or a teacher to your students, like you, someone that they might respect or look up to or, you know, whatnot, normalizing this and saying, you know, this is something I go through. So that's why I wear these specific glasses this time of year. Um, you might notice our classroom, the lighting is a little different because I changed all of our bulbs to full spectrum bulbs and it doesn't cure it, but it definitely helps me. Um, you're planting a seed that then if they start to feel similar symptoms or if they have more questions, or if they know that they experience these things, they don't feel alone. So um, whenever you have those opportunities to sort of feel genuine and honest and you know, feel safe enough to talk about it, it's, it's just such a gift. And you might not even know, <laughs> like you might've planted a seed and like 10 years later when they went off to Western Washington University and they were feeling incredibly low, um, they went and sought help because of something you said in second grade. Like you might not ever know that, but you can make those differences. You can, you know, help with that for sure. 
So that takes us to the end of this webinar. I just wondered, are there any final thoughts or things that you think you know, are really important to, to give people on their path? Um, and maybe also in the end, you know, what's, uh, what's something that you do that helps you when you have <laughs> these kinds of seasonal disorders? Now, I'll, I'll do the same. I'll, I'll say the same thing. I love it. I love it. So the, my issue is with um, COVID, it's become really hard. So my favorite thing in the world is to travel with my family, my children, especially. Um, we love, you know, in the winter months or when it's really cold when we're living in Bozeman, we love to visit our friends in Southern California, you know, get your toes in the sand, get more sunlight. It's just, you don't even realize how much, how much you need. I'm looking right now here. I'm going to show you. This is on my desk. This is a picture of my little ones when they were little, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just like, to me, I just, it, it refills my bucket and the last, you know, lack of travel the last couple um, years or last year plus um, has really had a huge impact. So you don't even realize it unless you do those check-ins, like what's so different about this winter than other winters? Oh, that's right. <laughs> like usually I go somewhere, or I do something. So how are you going to replace that? And really being conscious with it because it might feel good not to spend that money. So you might be like, Ooh, I'm, you know, I'm just going to sort of, you know, prize that and go somewhere better later, but you need something then if that makes sense. So yeah, I, I love to sort of get away and I can't always right now. So I'm going a little crazy. <laughs> and there might also be mini trips, like for example, where I live, um, because I, I'm right at the start of the Alps here in Switzerland and that that's fantastic. And I have a, an incredible view all the time. However, it also means that sort of midway through October until about end of November, we've got fog. And where I live, unfortunately, I'm at the foot of the Alps. <laughs> so we have fog. It's gray. And when I say gray, I really mean like from morning till evening, it's gray. Okay. And so what I do a lot is I actually go up a mountain because fortunately they're close and it's that's mm -hmm. cheap, you know, and I go for a walk up there. Sometimes I even take my computer and I work from there just so that I have a little bit of sunlight. And then it actually really, the fog actually feels really nice because you're above it and it just... Yes. You know, you can see so far, but you also know that where you would be if you didn't have this chance to go up here. So maybe there's, you know, shorter, shorter trips you can do, like a, a, a day trip somewhere to a park or something like that, that could help you as well, if, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And I, I think I want to go visit you. I want to see that mountaintop. You just yeah. picture, right. like I can have it in my mind. Clearly, that sounds amazing. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite nice actually. I have to admit, I'm very lucky with that that I get to get to escape quite easily because it only takes 10 minutes by car and then I'd say it's like a an, an hour walk up. Um, oh, wow. and, and I'm in the sun and that's like pretty much what I do every single weekend and even during the week sometimes, you know, if I if I can manage to uh, to work uh, disconnected, then I take my work up there and uh, they have nice little places to have a coffee as well. So that's uh, yeah. All good. All right. Well, thank you very, very much for this. Any final parting thought for our audience? Um, I think I think what you said is perfect and it's the greatest image. And just really whatever that mountaintop is for you, like put value in that. That's important. Um, and it's just as important as doing the laundry or making dinner. Like maybe you grab pizza instead of making a dinner, but you go out to the park, like you said, to do it. So your mental health is important um, and it makes you better everywhere, whether it's connecting in relationships or at work, all of those things. So prioritize it. Great. That's a, that's a great final thought. That's something that uh, I think everybody could, uh, could really try and listen to and incorporate. And I'll take that home with me as well and <laughs> try to do things, more things for my, for my mental health than I'm even doing now. So thank you very much, Christy, for this informative talk. And again, if there's any other questions that pop up later, you can always drop them into our social and we'll get them answered. Um, and we'll have another webinar for you soon, which we'll also announce on our social media. So thank you everybody for joining us, whether you're joining here live or whether you're watching the stream, um, or if you're even watching the recording later, um, you're very welcome to answer, that, to ask any questions, and we hope you've, you've enjoyed this webinar. So thank you very much and have a very good rest of your day. You too. Bye.